I had a student who had, over the course of the first semester, had progressively been scoring higher on our formal writing, like, you know, five out of eight, six out of eight, seven and a half out of eight. And I'm watching this happen on my end, giving feedback, looking at the data, celebrating it. Like, you're doing awesome. This is great. And I, in my head, this is a success story because it seems like that. And then I go, because we have a tracker where they're reflecting each time they do this and engaging with reflection. And I go back and look at their reflection sheet over the course of the semester. And they're saying, I failed. I failed. I still failed. And their mindset of the semester was, I can't figure out a way to be successful. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Optimalist, a podcast where we have set out to explore the optimal way to educate in the age of AI. If you're new here, I am Sarah Candela, your host through this exploration of the elements of human flourishing. Marcus Luther is a 12th year high school English teacher. He's also the co-creator of the Broken Copier podcast and the Substack newsletter of the same name, both with a focus on teacher-centered topics from the perspective of teachers themselves. I know Marcus as the guy who posts a lot of handwritten classroom work on Twitter, namely a lot of samples of student reflective work. This is not limited to journaling and exit tickets, but rather has evolved into a comprehensive class structure in which students reflect just as much about thoughts and actions as they do about the literature that they are reading. The result is students who are more self-aware and able to recognize changes in their own progress, motivating them to dive deeper or even just keep going. And it's not just at an individual level. Marcus's students are learning how to be vulnerable together and share reflection as a group experience. And the key to all of this is teacher participation. Marcus reflects every day with his students and shares his progress right along with their own, modeling the consistency needed to teach even higher order thinking through reflection. So today, Marcus Luther asks, why is reflection so hard? Go. <laughs> I'm going to just go straight to, to leading us into opening this discussion because I want to get into the meat of it. So when you think about the position you have now and the role that you've created for yourself or reputation, rather, I think that's what I would consider it a reputation that you've created for yourself now on the internet and especially on Twitter, which is where I know you from, um, and the work that you have started to be known for, what I'm assume I'm assuming that that's the work that's the most important to you, the stuff that you share and the stuff that you talk about. So what is it that you would define as the important work that you're doing now? And what has influenced your path up to this point? Thank you for that question. And I think one of the, the biggest things that I've experienced the last couple of years in sharing more of what we're doing in our classroom uh, with others, including online, uh, is just like participating in that reflection actively as a teacher and selfishly like learning so much from other teachers along the way, which was something early in my career uh, was just kind of a foundational value. I uh, you know, started my career, you know, rural Arkansas. It was originally through Teach for America, though no longer through that, and ended up staying in Arkansas for almost a decade. But I, there's like all these new teachers who were all over the state, and we talk all the time about like, what are we doing? And these are conversations, of course, that were happening in our buildings, but we also had this network that was outside of it. And I think I just never went away from that need uh, and just joy of talking about teaching with other teachers and really finding that valuable in our own classroom. And then of course, hearing from others that it, you know, it felt good to be able to say, you know, the teaching's a team thing that we are all in this together. And if something's working in my classroom, here you go. And uh, that was just kind of what I was normed with at the beginning of my career, uh, mm-hmm. 12 years ago, uh, back when the hairline hadn't receded as much. And, uh, <laughs> Now we're, we're here and I, and I guess in recent years, like learning that social, you know, finding social media and connecting with teachers mm-hmm. all over the place has been a really cool thing that I, you know, I wish I would have started earlier, but I'm really excited to be making the connections I am now because ultimately it comes back to making our classroom better, uh, and mm-hmm. for my students. And then of course, 
hearing that if it's valuable for others, I have no reason not to share it. Cause I just, uh, again, my deeper value is that this is not individual work. This is like teaching is a community thing and we're all trying to get better for our students and serving them. So if sharing our ideas and resources makes that happen, then we should all be for that. Yeah. And it is amazing the difference when you hear someone talk about it um, as inclusively as you do, the difference is so noticeable. Um, and I say that because it's always surprising. And I said before, you and I know each other from Twitter, as do a lot of people in both of our circles, I'm sure. But it is amazing when you do think how tiny the population of educators or professionals in any field are. I mean, to us, that's that whole, our whole community is coming from, and if they're outside of our actual school, like that's where everyone's coming from. But when you do talk to people in the school building, so few of them are even on something like Twitter. Um, or if they are, they're not really actively thinking about it as far as communicating with people one on one. And that always is, as I've gotten deeper and deeper into this kind of um, like outward networking and collaborating and sharing and friendships and all of that, it is always wild to me to think like most people don't, don't ever have any contact with this at all. Um, and it really truly is life changing, uh, as far as beyond your school building. And we have that access now. No, I 100% agree. And I very much, I don't blame anyone because a lot of times, like, mm -hmm. for the, for me, this is also just like a hobby. I like, I enjoy thinking about this. I enjoy talking about this, such as this conversation. Uh, and it's happening outside of, you know, contracted hours. So as teachers, we have a lot on our plates. And I think this gets back to like the reflection part too. It, everything that we really find valuable a lot of times comes across as this extra thing, like this mm -hmm. one extra thing, whether it's reflecting ourselves as teachers uh, outside of work hours or in our classrooms when it's not one of the things that you're going to get hammered for not doing, like it's an extra thing for a lot of teachers. And those extras get pushed out when you don't have enough time and resources, which is the case for so many teachers right now and has been for some time. Yeah, and I like that you're bringing up right away this um just the phrase one extra thing. The one we've been talking about that a lot in our community, especially in in terms of reflective practice because when we're trying to give people even even handing people resources for doing more reflection or integrating reflection um into a classroom, the we're trying to frame it in a way where let's how do we frame it in a way really where it's like, we're not asking you to do, it might look like we're asking you to do one more thing, but if we think about all of the other things, there are, there's gotta be things that we, cause every, when you mention reflective practice to people in the classroom, there's almost, I don't know that I ever hear anyone say like, this is not important. Everybody's doing it in some way, even if it's tiny and wishes that they could do more of it, but can't find that space. And so my, my, my obsession over reflection is so strong right now that I'm asking this question of people right now. How can we make that space? Because I don't want it to be one more thing. I want it to feel like this is one of the most important things. And so it's, it's really top of mind right now, helping people think about what can they, what can they alleviate from their schedule? What can they do a little bit less of to make it think it's hard to not be reactive, right? When someone says, well, you need to do you, why aren't you doing more of this? Or isn't this really cool? Why can't we do this? But like, how can, how can we, and, and, and actually this is related to the, one of the que first questions I wanted to ask you was like, when you, you're talking about your, you know, history with thinking about being reflective with other educators and with yourself and how important that is. And I was also wondering if that being reflective as a teacher came before integrating it with students. And so thinking about that, it's also how do you make room for it? How do you encourage other people that this is something that should be a priority, not really maybe once a month we reflect on the unit we just finished? Um, how do we, how do we do all that? Can you answer all 20 of those questions at once, Marcus? <laughs> <laughs> no, of, of course. We'll just go in order. We'll start with number one. Uh, yeah. I think for me, the first thing in like framing it that shifted my thinking on reflection, because there's a lot of like, I can like laundry list of value in reflection, but failing when trying to bring into the classroom. And there's lots of different reasons for me falling flat on my face of trying to make that a real thing in the classroom. And I think I always thought about it as like a quantity thing and not a, a placement thing, because 
in my recent years, I really believe it's about centering reflection. So it's not about doing it at certain moments or building it or adding in these tools because the tools help, but the mindsets for me, the ball game where everything circles back to reflection and it, for, it comes with conviction too. And I think a lot of educators share this, but like my eyes are open in the same way. I've given the example and I've been wearing glasses for years since like second grade. And I remember like many people, they you know, first start wearing glasses or contact lenses and you look at the trees and you're like, oh, those are leaves. And like you start seeing like, oh, this is a world I wasn't aware of. Mm. And now in my classroom with the systems that we have, it kind of feels that way in understanding students learning and especially their perception of their own learning. Uh, I gave an example and I told this story in class today. Uh, I had a student who had over the course of the first semester had progressively been scoring higher on our formal writing, like, you know, five out of eight, six out of eight, seven and a half out of eight. And I'm watching this happen on my end, giving feedback, looking at the data, celebrating it. Like you're doing awesome. This is great. And I, in my head, this is a success story because it seems like that. And then I go, cause we have a tracker where they're reflecting each time they do this in engaging with reflection. And I go back and look at their reflection sheet over the course of the semester. And they're saying, I failed. I failed. Mm. I still failed. And their mindset of the semester was, I can't figure out a way to be successful. So we had a conversation from there, of course, and like that there's a whole follow up. But I, if I was just looking at the numbers and the data, I would have had no clue how that student saw their own learning journey. And that for me is the game changer is by embedding a system of reflection and engaging with it authentically and frequently and collaborating. Like we just had an activity today in class where they annotated their own reflections and we talked about them and I responded to them. I love that. Like, like it is, it, for me, it changes the way I understand how students are experiencing their own learning. And in that way, it's centering their voice and their perception rather than my own. And just in the example I gave, my own was not accurate. And I think as teachers... Uh, it's really hard to understand how students see themselves as learners. Mm -hmm. And my only solution to that has been centering reflection, not just doing it or adding it, but centering it in the classroom. Yeah, I love that phrase. I'm going to steal it and use it every day now, centering reflection. I love it because I always say I'm always talking about incorporating, integrating, but that's even, I think, better when you're thinking of an individual think you can integrate it into a school or a district, right? At that level, building level, but you want it at the center, the heart of the classroom. I'm thinking now as you're talking about the way, uh, especially like real time today examples of what, of what you're doing with students, what is their reaction to that approach to, it is a, a sort of assessment. It's a, it's a self-assessment in a way. And I think it combines sort of cognitive and emotional, all sorts of things into into one. And that's one of the things that I love when you really start to get yourself into what is reflection and you start to really think about it and do it and practice it, see the results of it. I think that's what it has the power to do. It brings together that cognitive. We think about where is SEL in our building. It brings that into the picture too. And we have such an opportunity in centering reflection to really take care of so many of these little elements that people People do say, where am I going to have the time for this? Or like, this is an extra thing that I have to do. I only do it once a week. But when we do think about the power that you're just, you know, describing from one day, um, I, I'm wondering, do the kids see that difference when they do something like this in your class versus maybe a class that they don't like, do they voice that to you? Do they notice like, what is the difference between when I reflect and when I don't reflect? Oh, they're, they're pretty like to start this year when we start setting up because these systems, and I think that is important to have a vision of working backwards from where we are today, where like, you know, end of the semester, we have all this work with reflection we've built up to to have these conversations. There's the front end of that where they walk in and they haven't been reflecting regularly on their learning that, that that's new for my classroom and except for recent years. And and students will a lot of times be surprised when you respond to what they say. And they're like, oh, you're reading this. Uh, and I remember that and too, I think, yeah. Uh, it's something that 
also, and I've even f- messed up on this recently, where you have to teach it. It's a skill and mm-hmm. you have to give exemplars and say like, this is what we're looking for. And this is what a good reflection looks like versus one that really isn't as valuable. And let's look at some examples and talk about it. And I think that being aware that students need support with reflection to get there. It's not just about creating that space and that, you know, that extra box at the end of the assignment or the exit ticket. It's about valuing it and how you talk about it, communicating expectations with it. And then of course, the the biggest thing is responding to it so they feel like it's valued. Like no, no one likes submitting surveys and reflections and sending them out into the ether and never seeing them again. Right. And it for me, the big thing is also students are surprised or it's like they walk in the next day and I've got the results, the collective results on the screen and say, and not just to show them, but to talk about it and to say, okay, if you are the teacher and this is the reflective data you're seeing, what would you do? And having the small group conversations and then whole group. And at first it's weird. Like you said, like it's not something that's normal, Mm -hmm. but then it normalizes itself. And then the writing, the written reflection is almost secondary to the conversations that they have with each other about their learning. And I think the other way that that transforms the school year, you think about students, like for me, high school students, and they've got six other classes, they've got these jobs and extracurricular responsibilities, they got all these other things. And even though we think about our classrooms all the time, and it feels like this it's really the clean only narrative, <laughs> this is, like we know what's going on, right. they've got all these interruptions, we almost lost a whole week of the snow recently. And oh, yeah. The, and the reflection is the glue. And it, it that makes the different things we do come back together. It puts it in one place. It, it, it It's seamless in a way, especially when you're trying to do different things. Like we have different genres of writing and different projects mm-hmm. and different units and books. But the reflection space is the same one for us. And they keep coming back to it. And I, I believe firmly that that helps unify and make coherent our journey in our classroom for students who have so much going on. And I think it's our job as teachers to help them see their coherent learning journey in a way that's accessible to them. And for me, that's the only way I know how. And I do want to get to our core question that we want to explore in a minute. But having heard what you just said about how you're structuring that, I do want to just quickly ask the kind of maybe you can give a little bit of just a, a teaser overview of the kind of change you might see in a whole class or individual on an individual level um, from the beginning to the end of the year. Do you see do you have ways of I'm sure you do right built in benchmarks for sort of evaluating or maybe they're self evaluating their reflective practice over the course of a year? Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a tricky thing because I'm a firm believer that like the grade should reflect the learning standards that have been assigned to me. And I, I try to stick to that. And there's not a lot there, right? Like we have this, this a lot of times in schools, we say this is valuable for our students, but it's not in the standards or curriculum. So trying to find a way to center the rubric, grade, et cetera, can be a little bit of a fine dance, but I definitely can see the growth and they'll even say like, oh, I see what I was writing earlier and I see what I was doing earlier in this reflective space and it's different now. And that was a conversation they had mm. today. You know, we, we went around the room and they, they each shared one. Uh, I use I use a lot of Marissa Thompson's TQE system for annotations. And they I was just, just reading all about that yeah. two days ago. It's <laughs> That's really funny. absolutely incredible. Okay. Cannot recommend yeah. it more. She's incredible. And mm-hmm. They, we use that for our reading our text in our classroom, but we did that with our self reflections and then they shared aloud. And I guess like the biggest measure of that is they were sharing aloud whole class, their own reflections on their own learning, everyone, not just like two or three volunteers. And, and that is a, a gargantuan leap from where they were at the beginning of September. The transformation from written reflection that a teacher might see to conversations aloud in the entire classroom. You know, for me, that's the measure that's most authentic because the ability to talk reflect Effectively yeah. is a skill that probably translates far more than anything that would happen in writing outside the classroom. Definitely. And I, I know it's and it seems counterintuitive because people talk so often in all fields, not just education, when it comes to writing anything, that that is where the process of understanding and even if it's not writing about even if it's not research based or writing about, you know, writing for learning, but when you're just writing your own, like writing a blog, like something that you want to write about off the top of your head, like they often talk about writing being the way to organize that. But I do you think in reflective practices, it often works the opposite way. Like what I might write tends to be a little bit more journalistic and like 
all over the place. And I think it's often where reflection can sometimes get a very different name because that's what people think about when they think of still even even in an academic context, we might think of like, I'm going to write in my journal at the beginning of the week and then at the end of the like, I just think of different ways that I've seen people do it over the years. And then I think that's where it kind of gets separated from cognition and from academics. We don't often associate it with that. And so the talking about it, the bringing it into discussion and opening up that vulnerability to being something that is accessible to all students and the teacher, I think is not what we're used to. We're not used to thinking, we're thinking of we reflect individually by ourselves. Maybe I'll ask you to share in small groups. Maybe we'll approach who wants to talk about this, but it's not, if it's not done, the reason why I'm, I love talking to you about this is because the way it's so obvious that the only way it works is that you're always doing it. And that vulnerability and joy that comes from that is only happening it's only going to grow because you're doing it with them um, of course, all the time. It has to be teacher centered yeah. too, like or not teacher centered, I should say, but teacher modeled. If you are not reflecting transparently with your students in your practice uh, and modeling for them what that looks like, how can you ask them to do the same? And we all like I think of the best building leaders and administrators that I've had, and I've had great ones, and I'm very grateful for this. They do the same thing with their teachers, and they say like, "Here's something that, like I struggled with or a hard choice." and like and bring us into that conversational space and model reflection as leaders we have to do that in our classrooms with our students before we want them to be reflective uh and i think that's hard and and i'll acknowledge that it's a lot easier Mm -hmm. year 12 than it was year two to say you know what guys i made a mistake here i'm struggling with this and i get that i'm at a different point in my career where it's easier to be vulnerable uh and yeah. so I, I, I think if you're listening to this and you're like a new teacher, it probably sounds different. And the idea of standing in front of your entire class that maybe is not going yeah. so well and then naming, hey, here's what I'm struggling with. Like, it just feels like a pile on is going to so happen. So hard to do that so, at the beginning. So I yeah. want to acknowledge that. Like that, that is one challenge. Yeah. It's like it's, it's easier for me to do this now than it used to be. And I think it's important to name that. Yeah, that's a great point. And I do think that talking about all the different levels um, as an administrator or as a uh, classroom teacher and then a student and everybody kind of, I love, always love the idea of when it is something that everybody has to learn, like reflection will probably never stop being something that's challenging. I love, that's something that I love about it. It's always going to be different what class you're in, like what stage you're in, how old you are, what you're going through in life. It's always going to reflect, reflect what it is that you're doing at that moment. But it makes it, it is kind of cool to think about that in terms of what makes us avoid it, you know? And so today we wanted to explore a little bit about, about why we do kind of shy away from uh, maybe one of the reasons is not having, not thinking that we have time, but one of the reasons for not thinking we have time is not the time itself, but maybe the effort that might go into establishing something like, what is, what does this mean? Like, is it something that I'm going to have to, like you were mentioning first, first year or beginning teachers, like how much of myself or is it going to take to model this, to make it worthwhile for students to then be able to succeed at on their own or feel like they can share. And so the question we wanted to explore was, what is it that makes reflection so hard? Because even if we remove it from the school setting and think of ourselves individually, we don't like looking in the mirror and thinking about what it is that we might want to improve. And if we do, we often need a break from it, right? We can't think about that every day. And so if we could explore that a little, what is it that makes us not not want to use this as a as the center of our class? When I'm thinking about like this current moment and like what it means to be a teacher right now and all the challenges and like I've experienced pretty much throughout my career, uh, being surrounded by affirmation, support, and people seeing me mm-hmm. as like a valuable teacher. Not just mean perfect doesn't mean like people were saying like, hey here's what you need to get better at like definitely an ongoing process but at no point when i think back to the last 12 years was i not surrounded by people who saw me as bringing value and doing well and caring about students and i felt supported and affirmed i'm so grateful to have worked in these different environments where i had that not every teacher has that right now and probably less than ever in terms of being surrounded by affirmation and validation for the work that you do if you don't have that, standing in front of the room and being vulnerable, being opening yeah. yourself up to reflective practices 
is such a different experience. And I'm just acknowledging that I don't have that experience. And so I, cause I, I would imagine that if you don't have that support and you don't look in the mirror and say, I am looking at a good teacher who's doing good things for students to then step into a classroom and model and lead with reflection and being reflective and talking about your own classroom with other teachers and administrators and saying, come on in, like, come on in looks a lot different when you don't feel confident about what's mm-hmm. going on. And it's just really hard right now for teachers, uh, given all the circumstances and we don't need to go down all the many roads that we're aware of that make teachers not feel supported and feeling even attacked at times. So I think for me at a foundational level, that has to be named in as a centerpiece for why reflection isn't happening potentially, mm. because we're not giving teachers the support they need to be reflective, not just in time, because time's a big one, right. but also in terms of valuing and affirming teachers for the work they're doing. Right. And because self-reflection, and like I said before, even if we remove it from the workplace, from the school setting and think of like just reflecting on your own at home or in your own, you know, even even going back to writing in a journal or right at the end of the day thinking, okay, what are, what are the top, a lot of people do, what are the top three things that I did today? Or what are the top three things that I want to reflect on for the end of the week? Even in your personal life, you know, self-reflection makes us doubt um, what we're doing. If, we, if we're doing it by ourselves, even though it's called self-reflection, I think it's so important that you're tracing those next steps and connecting them for yourself and for students that just doing it alone kind of doesn't mean something over time or mean anything over time if you're not then connecting it to something larger. Because that, And that's something I've been thinking about a lot too. And I, I don't know that we all see ref- reflection in that way because it does tend to have that personal stamp on it. And so really talking openly with people like this about what does it mean or look like to connect those webs of like, okay, I have 30 10th graders that are doing individual reflections, and then how do I connect them together and and then show them that all of those thoughts and developments internally are part of a larger development externally. And I do think that's how we get towards things like alignment, because that class of 30 becomes a microcosm for the school, which is a microcosm for their home community. How do we all take self-reflection that might make us feel vulnerable and doubt ourselves and turn it into an activity that winds up connecting and aligning us in goals and values? Yeah. And I think the 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 follow-up from reflection is probably another challenge. There, like, There's a so what as a teacher in mm-hmm. that, okay, I got all these great reflections from students. What do I do? And yeah. it's like, oh, you did your reflection. Great. Move on. And I think that's also really challenging. And I've struggled with that and still struggle with that of like, what is the next step? What comes after reflection, especially as a teacher facilitating in your classroom? And I, I would imagine like that's where you might say, oh, I did this reflective activity. I added it to the end of my worksheet. I looked like everyone gave their responses. Maybe I talked with someone about the results and then I went back to my normal. And I think that's where I would imagine that next step can be either intimidating or just like really challenging to navigate. Uh, especially again, when, if you're new at it, or new in your content area, or in an unsupportive place where you've just got too much on your shoulders mm-hmm. already. Yeah, you just reminded me of something I was going to mention earlier when you were talking about student work, but when and also the the sort of um, maybe preconceived no- notions that people do have about reflection, but that idea of it, we're used to knowing that it's important and feeling like motivated to use it and do it and ask reflective questions, but maybe we're kind of just putting it at the end of something. Um, and then because the teacher doesn't there, we, we're not really doing anything with it. We're just kind of look, we might be reading it, but we're not actually giving feedback back. Like you say, your kids are shocked when they come in the next day and you're like, here's what happened in this class yesterday. But I don't think that we see, ref- we don't, you know, as a whole, see reflection as something that we then talk back with that back and forth, um, and and I think there's a surprise, a level of surprise there, like when you do see that, which is what you're, um, and I I don't I I do I just have this like idealistic 
view of what it would look like for a whole school building to be. I'm starting with one school. That's my ideal <laughs> one school. If everybody were thinking in that manner that you are describing of um, that makes you take reflective reflective practice a little bit more seriously, I think if you know that, oh, this is not just staying in this notebook, or it's not just me answering five little checkpoints at the end of this exam. Someone's going to read this and think about it as a whole in terms of my growth. Yeah. And I think now like from the teacher lens, because I, I think many teachers have filled up many a reflective form or evaluation, pre-reflection, where you just, you don't feel like, you feel like you're doing it to check a box or you're yeah. doing this to fill out this form that's not tailored to your own classroom. There's no follow-up conversation. Uh, and I think that's where we have to make it better in our classrooms. But like, I like to, like what I do with the same reflective practice that students fill out for every assessment or formal writing assessment, I do the same thing with my own, myself. So I have my own Google Doc that mimics theirs, parallels theirs. And I reflect on my process of how did I do as a teacher, this unit, and like what were the steps and choices I made? And then on the data and the feedback, like what, what did I learn from their results and what do I want to take with me going forward? Like I find that document over the course of a year way more valuable than any like, you know, mm. standard form of reflection or evaluation that I've filled out countless times throughout my career. And I would love to have, I think, a conversation with, you know, a, a colleague or an administrator, or of course, with students, because that's a, I'm transparent with it with students. Uh, like for me, that is what authentic reflection looks like is that it has to have that next step. It has to be integrated into conversation, into future practices. It can't be a dead end. And I think exactly. most reflections we have are dead ends. They're, yes. the, they're the last step. Mm -hmm. Just do this one more thing and then you're done and we move on. It, it does feel in the moment like it's a closure. I, I mean, I used to do it myself even and I'm thinking about, you know, when I was a beginning teacher and I would add certain things to certain assessments or even at the be end of class or beginning of class. And it does feel like it has a, there's like a closure to it. Oh, good. I asked that question. But when you think about what's the purpose of it, and it, sometimes all it takes is one kid to ask, why did we have to answer that question? <laughs> like, or, hey, why did you want to know about my XYZ? And I'm like, I don't know. Why did I want to know about that? <laughs> and to, that would make me think, what is the action that I want to result, what is the result there from asking that rather than it just be a tidy little bow to tie on the end of this to have them end the assessment with thinking about something. And it goes, like you were saying, goes the same way if I'm asked to fill out something um, as a teacher as well. Like, I want to know what what am I doing with this or what, what should I be thinking about next? And that brings me to just one or two of the things I had throughout, throughout this question of why is reflection so hard? on Twitter over the last couple of days. And one of the responses was the lack of knowledge around next steps. And so, and it's also tied to a second one of, um, which was unclear definitions of success. So you've just, without me even bringing that up, you've confirmed that lack of knowledge around next steps is a hundred percent something that I think everyone doesn't know how to approach or, or has to, you really have to think about what is the action that, you know, unless I'm, I'm able to help motivate, because I think the self motivation part of it is a big, a big thing in reflection, right? If you're integrating it or centering it, um, I think eventually knowing the next steps is something that we can build on. Am I? I don't know if I'm thinking about this in the same way that you do, um, but to me, it's like if I'm if I'm integrating this well over time, my action should become something that is a little bit more self-motivating rather than having to wait for an instruction. No, and I think there's a lot of different like what next steps look like. And I think that's where like content mastery and, you know, teaching experience, like all those mm -hmm. things make it easier to respond. And I think that's the, I mean, another thing that makes it hard is that not only are you going to get requests or you're going to read things or hear things that you might not know what the solution is. And that's mm -hmm. hard to motivate yourself to go into that space. You're also going to hear negative things, right? You're going to hear, well, I didn't feel like I was supported uh, in this activity right. as much. And we know how it works, right? You get a hundred responses. Like I went through a quick one the other day and had like 99 very positive responses. And I can tell you exactly where the student was sitting who wrote the one that was <laughs> negative. And I, I, again, of course. and like, that's mm -hmm. just how our brains work. Yeah. And I think it's hard to like walk into that space when, again, going back to what I've said, but I think it matters. 
if you're not supported, if you're not feeling confident, if you're struggling individually to then open yourself up to getting negative feedback and reading negative student reflections at times, I think that's a hard, it's a hard ask for teachers. Uh, and I, that's where you have to build up your own capacity to do that. It's a lot easier for me to say that than to in the various contexts out there to make that a reality. So I think in terms of challenges, uh, responding to hard feedback or difficult uh, reflections is something that can be a barrier that keeps reflection from happening as much as it needs to. Yeah. And then in terms of, I guess it's best to think about this in terms of your own experience and how you've, um, I guess, increasingly worked at this over the last, what I, how many years have you, have you, do you think you've been doing this uh, really moving towards more reflective practice? In terms of going, just borrowing my own word in terms of centering it, where I yeah. think I feel like this is my second year of really building systems from day one okay. that allowed reflection to be at the center of what we're doing. So this is still relatively new. Okay. Me. So with that in mind, in that, in your own experience of building it throughout the course of a year, um, just to kind of try to answer one of these other questions that people had was the unclear definitions of success. How are you building? Are you building clear definitions? How do students understand what it means to be successful? Is that important to say? Is there such thing as I am a successful reflector? (laughs) Is that even um, does that even make sense to our brains to think of that of um, like, what does success mean in terms of A student who leaves your class at the end of the year, um, who completely is a different thinker from uh, that than than they were the year before. Like, is that how do you think of success for them? Well, and I really I appreciate that question because I don't think I I think of that as maybe as much as I should in terms of reflection as well. It is only year two, you know. Maybe that's what year three is for. (laughs) It it could be, and I've talked about this before and stolen things for future years because I'm trying to keep building this. Because I think a lot of times the two things I'm looking at are, is it leading to better learning and their growth and their their confidence in themselves as learners, not just like data points, but do they see themselves as better writers, as better like students overall? Which is a reflection thinkers. in itself, right? How Which you is see a reflection yourself. in itself. Yeah. And so I think that's my first like rubric is like their own perception of themselves when they walk out of the classroom. Like one of my goals is I want you to believe you're a better writer and I can watch that journey happen in our systems. And then the second one is from a community centric. And I, I like, I'm a, I think in terms of like what motivates me just to be in the classroom still and have no plans on leaving and uh, is just the classroom community is like the most powerful space I've ever been in. And I just year after year am amazed at what it can be. And one of my accountability tools for measuring Uh, our classroom. Like we just did, uh, we have four classroom core beliefs that we go over at the start of the year. It's on every desk, it's on our walls. And then they measure our classroom community. They say like, what are we doing? Well, which of these beliefs are we leading up to? Which ones are we not? And like reflection is part of that. And like, so they measure themselves by their, their perception of how reflective our classroom is. And we talk about those results. Mm -hmm. We just did that today. And I think that seeing it become realized not just on these, you know, Google documents that I see and the student sees and we interact with as a system. That's important, but also it's a conversation allowed in our classroom and students yeah. see other students and experience other students reflecting openly with each other. That's for me, the other measure of success that I try to really now I, in terms of like a data point rubric, I, I don't have one for that, but it, it's felt because students voice it. And especially looking into semester two, like, how do we build mm-hmm. on where we're at right now? I, I, today was kind of like my own personal question is what's next? Like, how do we push ourselves further? And uh, I, there, there very well could not be an answer to this, but if, um, or the answer could be no, <laughs> but re- just thinking about what you're just saying, do you see that there is an extension of that openness in being able to question and think out loud? Is there, does that extend having learned it from being reflective together, does it extend to something that you might see more strictly as an academic discussion? Like we're talking about characterization, we're talking about a novel. 
And um, there are they more open to, in some way, asking questions about what they're reading or learning um, than you think they maybe would have been a few years ago before you were doing this? I think the bigger shift that I see happening is they're more open of sharing with each other how they're doing and not okay. just their friends, uh, not just, you know, the people they know, but as a whole class conversation and bringing, and I think we also try to design our course so that, you know, going back to the mirror window concept that the, the mirror steps up in the second semester where they're really thinking about how text impact them, how they bring their own experiences and identities and perceptions mm -hmm. into the, what they read and the discussion. So they have to be able to talk about themselves. They have to talk about their own story. Yeah. And we shift from reading that. other stories to we end the year with projects that give them platforms to share their own values and their stories for a reason. And I think of the critical thinking and metacognition that's built into reflection as being very walks hand in hand with that end goal of, I want you to leave this classroom better at telling your own story because the, at the end of the day, that's what matters. That's what translates beyond just like the next grade level. And knowing English, how to like, do that, right? Knowing how to communicate yeah. that. Um, and, and it's an ongoing story. It's not a fixed point. Like you got, it's, it's not something that you just say, okay, I'm done. Like it's, you're constantly revisiting it, which is what we're doing with our reflection all year. So, uh, yeah. And I appreciate that question. Cause it makes me think about how to kind of like name what we're doing a little bit more intentionally. The way you're describing that process also makes me think like even just reflecting all year, whether it's you talking about it or anybody else, it's, um, I, I think about how I've seen so many critiques of, or just um, expressions of exhaustion over the personal narrative essays <laughs> recent in recent years of students saying, how many times do I have to write a personal narrative for my English class? And I do think it made me laugh because I do think of like, I, I taught a lot of, um, I, I taught all, all all the grades in high school, but I did do a lot of 11th and 12th grade college prep classes at one point. And even when they got to 12th grade, part of it was part of what they were writing was a personal narrative. And I think of, wow, they're doing that from 9th through 12th. But how does it, how do you not make that feel tired? Um, because you don't want a 14 year old writing about themselves in the way that they would when they're 17. And I, and what if we eliminated all sorts of formal writing like that about ourselves and instead, um, thought about it in, in terms of my ongoing practice of reflecting and writing and speaking about myself over time? What does a four year arc of that look like? And then I write one personal narrative based on the evidence that I've collected about myself over this time. Um, I'm yeah, just and they're thinking about essentially this randomly. <laughs> no, I think they're essentially writing a narrative of their learning story with yeah. the system that we use. And I mean, that's the tangent of all tangents of, for me as an English teacher, separate from this is like, we do so many things that put students into boxes of like, you're writing this type of thing. Yes. Now you're writing this type of thing. So we're going from expository to argumentative to narrative. Like, we need to break down those walls going forward. And I know that those walls are convenient for standardized testing and all sorts of measurements that we like because they show up well on spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. But I think as we're breaking down those walls, that's where for me, and we try to do that a lot in the classroom, like where we go beyond these structures and we have mm -hmm. students experiment and take risks as writers. For me, part of being confident breaking down those walls and pushing students in that way is I have this system of reflection where I can see how students are experiencing it and I can kind of adjust and shift based on how that's going. Uh, and I don't feel like I'd be as confident trying out these new things in the classroom, especially with writing, for example, uh, if I didn't have a good measure of how students saw their own experience. So I think as a teacher, reflection and building it into your classroom just lets you do more things in a way that's supportive to students. Uh, and I think... That is a, a benefit I probably never even voiced until this conversation. So thank you. Uh, I like to hear I, I that. I felt it. I just didn't uh, think about it that way. And I, I would like to say that <clears throat> I'm hoping that anybody who listens to this, and no matter what discipline that you're 
teaching in. It doesn't matter what grade level or subject. I'm hoping that what I'm about to say we can think of as able to apply to any area because I, if I do think about it, I think it, it probably is true if you think about your own discipline and subject or grade. But in, I, I, you know, taught English for 15 years. And so that is, that makes it a lot easier to talk to you <laughs> because I understand exactly how you're incorporating it into your subject. But when you're talking about the experience of reflection, helping students to understand the context of what they're reading, as far as what's the most important is understanding how they fit into that overall narrative. It doesn't matter if they, you know, memorize the character development of 15 books over the course of however many years, which was something I won't get into that part, but it was something that was always an external struggle of mine when I was teaching because so many people wanted everything to be about, well, we have to, it's the novel that the, the text that's important. And for me, what I can't remember who said it now, but it echoed the thoughts of many other writers as well. But the idea that, uh, I wish I could remember the author, but somebody said, said it really well that when I write something, when I publish a novel and put it out into the world, um, and I think about students studying it, even college students reading it and writing a paper, I want to tell them, who cares what I think? Who cares what I quote unquote meant for the theme to be or how such and such a character is characterized? What I care about and what you should care about is what you think that character is not what I thought or what I meant, but what it becomes once you've read it as an individual. And then the person next to you has a different experience. And so when I put something into the world, it's filtered or reflected through each one of the 30 people in your room. And so when I apply that to the way you're approaching reflection, think of that now I'm imagining your whole classroom is turning into just like a disco ball of a million mirrors, <laughs> a million, a million reflected pieces, because each of them is a reflection of one book that they're reading or one piece, one poem. And then when you then bring all those reflections together as a group, there's something completely different that is created. And then, you know, that's how everything that we do and study and think about and write and discuss everything lives on through what we create what the experience we create of it for ourselves. And I, I wonder like if someone who is a math teacher, a history teacher, how can you apply that kind of thinking to your own subject as well, rather than just, you know, if we are going to move towards reflective thinking and then group reflective thinking, et cetera, you know, we do have to get way beyond just the context of, of, of the academic part of school. The end. That's, that's the end of my monologue. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I agree with that. And I think, of course, we live in our own content as teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that's universal. It's one of my convictions behind it and why I, I share about it a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Because I, I think unlike other things, you know, I share, like if I share like, you know, the, the eyes are watching God resource thing that, that not very applicable to a math classroom. But when I share about reflection, for me, it's every teacher should want to know how their students see themselves as learners in mm -hmm. their classroom where like how like in terms of we believe in the purpose of what we're teaching right like math is important science is important chemistry etc how does that student see your content how do they see their journey through your content and the identity they're going to walk away from how are you going to know you have to create a channel of reflection between you and your students and you know for me that's like that's what drives me right now to be is you know, mm -hmm. advocate for this because it has opened the door to me understanding how students see themselves in our classroom. And, and as I say that, this is not like a utopian, every student walks away feeling super confident and loves English and loves poetry and feels like they're brilliant <laughs> writers. Like that's not the case, but at least I know way more now how they feel. And I have conversations and can intervene now, as opposed to they leave the classroom and I just, you know, pretend to myself that it was a great year uh, and go into summer. Like I have their words to hold me accountable to their experience mm -hmm. and our conversations based on those words. And I think that's hard to think of, like holding yourself accountable to your students' perception of their learning versus just some data sheet that you might turn in at the end of the year. But that's what education should be. And I yes. think 
I don't know anyone who feels otherwise. I just get that it's really hard to make happen. It's still very hard for me, but I'd rather work towards that outcome than just keep running back what we have been doing because I don't think that's working. Uh, And I think it's there's a disconnect between that and the reality that our students are going out into. And I was just wondering one more follow up thing about this is just particular to your school, I guess. Do you? I'm not sure what if you're teaching all one level or not but um do you is there an opportunity if you after four years is there any way kids could have had you for four years (laughs) and seen i would love to see like what does it look like if they've been embedded (laughs) two years is the is the longest is the longest okay it's a small group of back to back i had my my very first year teaching i taught like it was a very small school i taught all the grade levels and i had one group who was 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade. I was not doing it. I only did it for me, one it, year as well. I yeah. had all four for one no, year. Yeah. No, they did not. Like, we did not have reflection embedded at that time. That was the first three years teaching. They saw me trip and we had a, and speaking of embedded, we had a, a, a small drama stage in my classroom embedded in the middle of the room. So they saw a first year <laughs> version of me trip and fall over that countless times. Excellent. So that is their, that's what they got to see. Uh, but no, I, I do think like I think there's value and it's always fun yeah. when like, you know, some of the kids who've had me before and we go to year two this year, they're like, Oh yeah, we know the drill. We know like what this like reflection stuff's gonna look yeah. like. But reflection yeah, stuff. Th- <laughs> yeah. They know That's the drill. Funny. So and, and it's it's still new for me. And I, I think and and for me I also I don't know, maybe I I'm weird with this, but I would rather try something new going into a school year than just run it back. And for and yeah. in recent years, like this has been my new. And I've enjoyed it. And there'll probably be other news going forward. But this is stuck in a a really uh, convicted way. And I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon for me. And just to kind of start to close out, I don't know that you mentioned this, but was there something, being that it has only been a couple years, was there something that ignited it to go full, to you to go full force into it? Or was it just a gradual thing that you were adding over time in little bits? I think that it was... In terms of it, kind of going back to our original point of quantity versus place, mm-hmm. I think the quantity has been there for a while and embedding the self-reflection. And I, uh, quite honestly, like the, this teaching over Zoom for a year, there was a lot of writing because you're using right. the chat box all the time and you're seeing like, oh, I'm understanding how students are experiencing that they're on learning a little bit more. But I was just getting overwhelmed because it was all in these different documents and it was mm-hmm. all over the place. And I was, and I, I try to be a systems thinker as much as possible and thinking to myself, how can this be something that isn't overextending me to, to make real and to center? And that's where I tried to shift to a solution that was, you know, in our example, the the core is this Google Doc that I create, share, you know, make a copy for each student, share with them, and we go back to it again and again and mm. again. And you know, it's the one thing that is our centerpiece of our classroom. And that's worked really well. And I really, uh, I'm sure there's other ways of doing it. But even when I used to do it on paper, like, and you're filing it away in the little files yeah. for your student, like, for me, that was too much. Like, I wasn't going to open every single file for all 150, 180 kids every time to do this reflection. But that Google Doc where it's a couple clicks away that I can create efficient systems to respond to, that has helped me. And I do think that the intention might have been there, but finding a system solution for my classroom, that was the pivot point that's made me feel more comfortable with it and also made me lean into it even more. Infinite kudos to Marcus Luther for giving us access to his thinking while building a classroom with reflection at the center. I highly recommend following Marcus on either Twitter or on Substack and everyone can check out his podcast even if you don't use the other two platforms. But his work is definitely something to watch. You will find Marcus's audience reflection question, as well as important quotes from the episode on my Twitter, Marcus's Twitter, or any of Swivel's social accounts, Uh, probably also on my LinkedIn as well, which I use a lot to promote podcast stuff. I encourage everyone to engage with these because they are meant to keep us moving and carrying the crux of this episode forward, even after we're done listening. As far as this podcast is concerned, please consider letting us know what you think by leaving a review or even just a rating. That's just clicking the stars, one to five stars in Apple Podcasts. 
This is especially important right now as we approach 50 episodes and are changing the format to be more focused on questions we want our audience to think about and take action on. Hence today's episode being called, Why is Reflection So Hard? You're going to see that format continue now after episode 41 and onward. So at this point, it's really helpful to hear from you the hashtag optimalist can be used when posting answers to questions that we ask here, especially if you can't find the original post. If you're looking, you saw us post something on Twitter and you thought about it later and wanted to go back and answer the question. If you type in the hashtag optimalist, then you'll be able to find everything we have posted forever. And the newest question should be right at the top. So you can always look for that tag. If you're looking to answer something after the fact, Um, and then I'll be sure to see it always. You can also reach me on Twitter at S Candela nine. That's Candela with one L. And if you must reach out to me privately and you don't want to DM me or you don't have the ability to DM me, I can be reached at Sarah at swivel.com. You can listen and subscribe to the Optimalist podcast wherever you love listening to great podcasts. New episodes are released every Wednesday and links to all of these resources are always available in the show notes. The Optimalist podcast is brought to you by Swivel. At Swivel, we understand that the biggest challenge in education is the rate of change. To learn how Swivel can help you be more reflective, engaged, and adaptable, visit swivel.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. A quick reminder before I go today that Swivel's newest device, Mirror, is entering into its second demo program cycle. Mirror is an AI-powered self-reflection tool that helps students and teachers both supercharge and regulate their reflective practice. We believe that the higher order skills that we all need in the age of AI are going to rely on our level of self-awareness and our ability to better manage our emotions, work habits, choices, relationships, and learning. And we're using AI to help us do that. Basically, Mirror is where we want you to meet your potential self, your best self. So click the link in the show notes to sign yourself or colleague up to be a part of this incredible opportunity. Basically, we send you a free mirror to your school and you use it with some light guidance from us over the course of 30 days. And then you tell us what happened. It is easy. So follow the link in the show notes to sign up now, or you can go to swivel.com to read around for more information. Thanks for listening to The Optimalist this week, and I will be back next week with a whole new conversation.